We are continuing with our theme. And so I think we would read our basic text, which is what I introduced a couple of weeks ago, or yeah, a few weeks ago. It's from Psalm 46. It's verses 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Five times God's people were commanded to stand still. Be still and know that I am God. So five times throughout the Old Testament, the people were commanded to stand still. The first is in Exodus 14, verse 13, and we'll look at that a bit more in detail in a minute. It was to see and experience God's deliverance. Stand still and you will ex experience the deliverance of God. Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show to you today. The second had to do with revelation. It was concerning God's word, to hear God's word. They were in a quandary, they didn't know quite what to do. They'd been on the journey from Egypt for 12 months, 12 months only. And they had come to the second occasion of the Passover. And it would be the last until they gained access to the Promised Land. And they were, they were in a dilemma, a problem occurred. Moses said to them, stand still. And I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. The third occasion had to do with direction. It was when the children of Israel arrived in the promised land. And God said that he would lead them with the ark. But he said, you are to keep a distance between you and the ark, 2,000 yards approximately, because you don't know which way to go. And then when they got to the river, he said, when you come to the brink of the water of Jordan, you shall stand still in Jordan. The fourth had to do with recollection. To recall God's ways. It was in the time of Samuel. When Samuel said, stand still, and I will recount to you the greatness of God. A particular verse is verse 7. Stand still that I may reason of all the righteous acts which the Lord did to you and your fathers. They had rejected Samuel from being the prophet, their leader, priest. He had come to the end of his days, more or less. And they said, make us a king. Samuel protested to them at what would happen in making that king. But he said, stand still and I will reason with you of all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did to you and to your fathers. We'll have a bit of a look at that. Or the fifth has to do with inspiration. To consider God's marvelous works. Job 37 verse 14. This is in the order of the scripture, of course, not in, the order, not in date order. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Psalm 46, 10 and 11, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Think on these things. And then we have a New Testament reference which we may just refer to very briefly in Mark 4, verse 39, when you have the situation of a storm at sea and Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. Jesus was in the back of the ship 
asleep on a pillow. And the disciples awakened him and said to him, Master, do you not care that we perish? How often have we felt like that? Of course he cares. He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Stand still to see the deliverance of God. Let's read Exodus 14, verses 1, and then we'll see how far we get. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiros. It means the place where sedge grows. Sedge comprises of water chestnuts, or in the Egyptian setting, papyrus. Between Migdal, which means the tower, over against Baal Zephon, which signifies Lord of the North. Before it you shall encamp by the sea, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. It's amazing how hard Pharaoh's heart had become. The Bible says he hardened his heart. Time and time again after Moses had gone to him and told him to let God's people go. And then demonstrated the miraculous power of God. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. But then there came a time when God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's what happens. If you harden your heart to the Word of God, so much there will come a time when He will harden your heart. The New Testament parallel is in 2 Thessalonians, I think it is, where it says that those who do not love the truth, even God will turn against them. Truth is absolute. It's not relative. If we harden our hearts, if we turn away from the truth of God, there comes a time when the God of truth turns away from us. And he says, all right, if you want to go your own way, then go your own way. This has happened throughout history. God has raised up prophetic voices. I don't claim to be a prophet. But God has, in the past and in the present, raised up prophetic voices of warning for the people. There are those who will listen and who will respond and who will find liberty in the truth. There are others who will not. And Pharaoh was of that disposition. And, and it's amazing, really. I mean, so many things that happened, so many devastating things the invasion of flies, the invasion of frogs, the inv invasion of lice, and then the death of every firstborn in every house in Egypt. Just think of that for a moment. That, that was incredible. There was a mourning that went on the next morning because every house found someone dead, and every beast firstborn beast of every sort of immediate forebear was killed. And then Pharaoh responded and said, get out of here. We've had enough. 
And then when Israel moved out with 600,000 footmen, besides women and children, it's been estimated a couple of million, he said, what have we done? They were our slaves. We've lost our workers. What have we done? And he recanted. Amazing. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh, verse 5, and of his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped by the sea in this place of where Sedge grew and where they had set up the Lord of the North as their sort of idol. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, because, poor old Moses, he comes in for it all the time, doesn't it? Doesn't he? Because there were no graves in Egypt. Why have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Well, I mean, a choice between being buried in Egypt and buried in the wilderness is no choice really, is it? <laughs> but they would pick on anything. Wherefore have you dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? And is not this the word that we did say to you in Egypt? saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom you have seen today you will see them again no more. The Lord will fight for you and you will hold your peace. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. They had reached a situation where they didn't know quite what to do. It was a sort of an impasse. Pharaoh and his chariots and his army were behind them. The hills were on either side, and in front of them was the Red Sea. They had reached an impasse. What could they do? They couldn't do anything. Moses came with the word of the Lord, stand still. You will see the salvation of of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you, and you will hold your peace. The Lord said unto Moses, Why are you crying to me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. So there was a period of standing still, and then there was a period of going forward in the same direction. Don't turn off to the left or to the right, or try to return. You won't get anywhere that way, but go forward. Romans 14, verse 23 says, He who doubts is damned if he eat. It's talking about eating prohibited things. And basically, Paul says, there's nothing, nothing in the food. Even if it's been offered to idols, there's no consequence to that. Because the idol is nothing. The only issue is whether you are going to cause a stumbling block to your brother or your sister. But he who doubts, if you've got a doubt in your heart about the validity of doing certain things, take for example now the fact that 
in, in our country and in very many countries of the world. Animals are sacrificed to Allah. Allah is not a true God. Allah is the moon God. Don't be confused by what the Islamists say. Allah was originally the moon God worshipped by Mohammed. And they've tried to make it a monotheistic thing. It's not. It's an idolatrous system. So, it comes back to how you react to a certain thing. Who is the stronger? God, our God, Jehovah, or Allah? Who is the stronger? Jehovah is the stronger. So basically, Paul says, there's nothing in the meat, and there's nothing in the fact that it's been offered to an idol. But it's how you react to it. It's your conscience. It's the effect your action is going to have on other people. And then he says, because he eats not in faith. If you cannot do it in faith, then don't do it. For whatsoever, and now, now he takes it outside of the area of eating and drinking. He says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Galatians 3.12, the law is not of faith. That's the Jewish law, is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. That's the whole system of the Jewish system. Judaistic system is the do's and the don'ts. And that's not faith. So basically, when we reach an impasse, a quandary, we are to stand still, that we may see the salvation of the Lord. Now, the next incident is very interesting in connection with this because it also relates to the Passover. The Passover was the last meal that, each, that, the, that Israel ate before they left, the, left Egypt. The last meal, the Passover lamb. We've had reference to it this morning. There are those who believe that there was never another Passover until they reached Israel. But I think there was. There was one other, and it introduces a very, very interesting incident. It relates to the second Passover. Numbers chapter 9. Turn with me to it, because... We're going to read a few verses here just to get the whole setting of this. Numbers chapter 9. And the Lord spoke unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover, that is this Passover this year, at his appointed season. In the fourteenth day of this month at even, you shall keep it in his appointed season, according to all the rites of it, and according to all the ceremonies thereof, shall you keep it. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month at even in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. Now this is the incident. Now there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man, that they could not keep the Passover on that day. Or they were told that they could not keep the Passover. Or they had doubts about whether they should keep the Passover. Because they had been defiled by a dead body. And when that happened in Israel, the Israelite concerned was excluded from the camp for a period of time. So these people, whoever they were, and it's interesting, Jamison, Fawcett, and Brown, in his commentary on this, says this, second Passover aloud, there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man. 
to discharge the last offices to the remains of de deceased relatives was imperative. And yet attendance on a funeral entailed ceremonial defilement, which led to exclusion from all society and for, from the camp for seven days. Some persons were in this situation at the arrival of the first Paschal anniversary, being painfully perplexed about the course of duty because they were temporarily disqualified at the proper season and having no opportunity of supplying their want were liable to a total privation of all their privileges, laid their case before Moses. Jewish writers assert that these men were the persons who had carried out the dead bodies of Nadab and Abihu, who rebelled against Moses. Albert Barnes notes on, in his uh, commentary, his notes on the whole Bible, Numbers 9-6, certain men, probably Mishael and Elis Afan, who buried their cousins, Nadab and Abihu, within a week of this Passover. So there is a dilemma. So what does Moses do? Now this, this, this is pertinent to us, not in respect of the Passover and all of those things, those are established and, and so on, but it's pertinent to us nevertheless because there are times when we're not sure what to do. And when we're not sure what to do, the best thing is to keep to the status quo. The best thing is to stand still and listen for the voice of God because the voice of God will come. So, verse 6 again, and there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man that they could not keep the Passover that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, We are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back? So they were in perplexity as well. They, 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 they didn't want to be kept away from the feast. And, and they asked Moses to state the case. Why? Is there not here a law which overrules another? Yes. If we've been, been defiled with the body of a dead man, we should be excluded from the camp. But what about the law which says that we should always, as Israelites, eat the Passover? What do we do? Is there a contradiction here? Why are we kept back that we may not offer an offering of the Lord in his appointed season among the children of Israel? And Moses said unto them, Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord says concerning you. Now, of course, in our day, we have to be careful that we don't take these things and apply them willy-nilly to ourselves. Because we have the Word of God. They didn't. They were in a period of the growing revelation of God. Now, I've always felt that the Word of God is like a, a picture, like a, like a painting on a canvas. And, and it starts off with indistinct lines and representations but then it becomes more detailed and, and increases and increases until at the end when you have the canon of Scripture, you have the wonder of God's revelation portrayed there completely. And after the canon of Scripture, we don't need to go to any other source to get our instruction. None of it. None of it. And, and it's very easy for us to, to slip into, you know, attitudes based on sympathy because we like a preacher or we appreciate what he says or whatever and, and, and we do not see the subtlety of getting away from the Word of God. Sola Scripture is our catch cry. Nothing outside of the Word of God. The extra-biblical books and, and now, by some, the extra-biblical structure to go to something that is Judaistic in order to 
find out the real truth. But the problem in doing that is so very often we get diverted. Because the real truth is in the total Word of God. And we get diverted about how Jesus acted to these sort of things. And we get diverted about how Paul acted towards these sort of things. Jesus said, I get my revelation not from the Judaistic schools of the day. I get my revelation from God himself. He said that over and over again. There are those who say that Jesus was trained in the schools of the rabbis. That is not so. The New Testament denies that totally and completely. When he was a boy, the Jewish rabbis were amazed at his knowledge. They were not teaching him. He was teaching them. He said, on many occasions and in different ways, all that I speak is directly from the Father. What he gives me to hear, I tell it to you. The same with, with Paul, who I think you could make a case for the fact that he was a rabbi, but he never calls himself a rabbi. Jesus never calls himself a rabbi. Now you can go into the history and, and what have you and establish the fact that, that they were. Although I, I think you'd be pressed to do that with Jesus. But certainly with Paul, who was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. Sure. But what he taught was not Judaistic in its basis. It was outside of that. Our friend... Larry de Bruyne, who is, I think, one of the greatest scholars in our particular school of thinking. He said, you know, all this talk about Hellenizing the church, actually, Paul was the first to Hellenize the church. He was. He went outside of Judaism. And he said, that means absolutely nothing to me. I reject it. It's all refuse. It's all done. If he were trained in it, he certainly did not follow it. He turned away from it. Now, I don't know how I got onto that, but <laughs> it, it is a consideration. It is a concern. It is really a concern because it's so easy to get diverted. There is only one through whom the revelation of God comes, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, he's going to incorporate the Jews, but he won't incorporate them on their basis. He will incorporate them on the basis of himself and his revelation. And they do not get into the kingdom by any other means other than the fact that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's the only door. That's the only door, brothers and sisters. And I think in these days we just have to nail our colors to the mast and we have to say it like it is because that's the way it is. So back to this passage. Those men said to him, look, what should we do? We're defiled by a dead body. Moses said, stand still and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning me, concerning you. Verse 9. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Now, as you go down, you'll find that these truths emerge. Moses said to them, Stand still and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. The answer is contained in verses 9 to 14. And basically, what he says, those who are unclean by death or burial may keep the feast and eat the Passover. So the law of the necessity of keeping this Passover overrode 
everything else. How do we apply that to here? Well, this is the closest that we have to the Passover ceremony. Eating that which represents the broken body and drinking that which represents the shed blood of Jesus. There are those who sometimes refuse to eat and drink because they feel that they've got sin in their life. They shouldn't do that. What they should do is simply confess their sin, experience the cleansing of the blood of Christ, and eat and drink. He that eats and drinks preaches my death, proclaims my death. I have never, ever refused this. Never. There are those who feel that you shouldn't eat and drink if you have something against your brother. Well, certainly you should be of a disposition to put it right. And if you can't put it right there and then because the person is not there, you should have that same attitude. But that should not cause you not to eat and drink. So this was the first thing. Those who are unclean by death or burial may keep the feast and eat the Passover. The second thing that emerged was those that are clean and not going on a journey must keep the feast and eat the Passover. If they didn't, they would be cut off from Israel. Make the application as you will. The third thing was those who are clean and on a journey may be excused from keeping the feast. And this has interesting ramifications upon what actually happened to the children of Israel. Because this was the last Passover until they entered the land of Canaan. You don't read of it again. Why? Because they're all on a journey. There was no obligation to keep the Passover. They were on a journey. It was very, very difficult to determine whether all of them were clean, but they were excluded because they were on a journey. But when they came to the Promised Land, the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and it says, and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. So I suppose the lesson to us is that it's very important whenever we have a query about the Word of God, and there are times when it crops up, for us to search the Scriptures to find the answer. And there will always be by comparing Scripture with Scripture and taking the Scripture in context, there will always be a resolution. Stand still the third time was to know divine direction. I'll hurry on. Read Joshua, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Let me read it very quickly for you. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, Why When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it that you may know the way by which you must go. 2,000 cubits, a cubit was about a... A, uh, um, a foot and a half, so um, 2,000, how many is that? 3,000 feet? 1,000 yards. About 1,000 yards, just to keep a, a distance. So, and, and the reason was that you may know the way by which you must go, for we have not passed this way here to fall. Okay, 
The Ark of the Covenant symbolized the presence of God, and it always led the way. <laughs> Note verse 4, there shall be a space so that you can see and you can go. And then specifically, he says in verse 8, and you shall command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the brink of the water of Jordan, here's another impasse. What will God do? It's not yet revealed, but it's all tied up in the thing that symbolizes the presence of God. Tell the priests to stand still at the brink of Jordan. And you know what happened. God divided the river just as he divided the sea. And they went over on dry land. So we stand still to know divine direction, which way to go, how to proceed. And then recollection, and here we just hasten on. 1 Samuel 12, 1 to 7. Just quickly flip over to there and let's see. Chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. As I've told you, it was a time when Samuel was protesting what the children of Israel did. They asked for a king. Now, there seems to be a bit of a paradox going on here. God said, okay, I'll give you the king. And, and then it, it, it was said by Samuel, behold, the Lord's anointed. Behold, he who is chosen. But it, he wasn't really the chosen one. He wasn't really the anointed one. He was for a period, but not for ongoing. God already had his eye on David. David was the anointed. David was the chosen. David was the one who would lead the children of Israel. Saul was, in effect, the people's choice. And you have to be careful about that. Now, I'm not saying that the ideas of the people have to be neglected, set aside. We would be fools, any of us who are leaders, if we ignored it. But by the same token, we have to be careful that we are not ruled by it. Democracy is man's idea, it's not God's idea. Now, of course, we've got to be careful when we replace democracy with theocracy. You've probably heard of the pastor who said, I believe in theocracy and my name is Theo. <laughs> It has to be a true theocracy. It has to be rulership by God. This is why, as Brother Jeff has brought to us so many times lately, and I'm so impressed with it, there is this absolute necessity of waiting on God. Seeking Him with our whole hearts. Now I know not everybody can get to the prayer meeting. But the prayer meeting is a measure of the health of the church. You can't measure its health by those who attend the popular meetings. Although we want people to attend all meetings, including the popular meetings. But it's measured by those who intently seek after the Lord. In my writing of this book, Who is Jesus? I, I've got to that section, and some of you know. Although you haven't read it yet. <laughs> so you don't know. And, 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 the, and the main part of my, 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 my thrust is that unless we know Jesus, we can't preach him, we can't proclaim him. We've got to know him. That's why Jesus said, follow me. I will make you. That's why he said, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest under your soul. And, and what, I, what I see is not just the, the, the major incidents in Christ's life, but his whole life. You see, when he said, follow me and I will make you, he set off for the cross. And so if they're going to follow him, they've got to follow him all the way to the cross. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about the baby born in a manger. 
It's about the cross. And Jesus is heading for the cross. And that is the thing in our lives where Paul says, I am crucified. That's the big ego crossed out. That's what the cross is. That's the symbol of the cross. It's my ego, me, crossed out. And this is what's wrong with so much of the singing today. There may be nice lyrics, there may be jazzy music, but it's me-centered. Just, just analyze it. It's nearly always me-centered. The great hymns of the past, when God met with his people in revival, were all God-centered. Great God of wonders, all thy ways display the attributes divine. But countless acts of pardoning grace beyond thine other wonders shine. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich and free? Don't let me go because I keep on going. And it cuts across the very philosophy and everything of the modern church. So that really today to get numbers... You've got to go with those songs. When I was part of the Assemblies of God and I was on the national executive only for three years, that was, I, couldn't, I couldn't stand it any longer. I remember one of the executive men saying, if you want to get the people, you've got to put him, the person in the center. It's all me related, me related. That's what they did. What happened? You've got men in the center, and you've got numerous men coming, but God has gone. Where is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord which brings wisdom, which is clean, which endures forever. Men and churches do not endure forever, but He endures forever. And so Samuel says, okay, and and let me read that text again, because I must hasten. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord and the righteous acts of God, which he did to you and to your fathers. And he begins to recount what happened in history. And then it says, in order that you may know how serious what you have done is. He says, look, it's harvest time. Normally we have good weather. But I'm going to ask the Lord to send thunder and lightnings so that you may know how serious your rebellion and your sin is. When the people ask for a king... Samuel felt insulted. They had turned from him. And God said, Samuel, don't take it personal. They've not rejected you. They've rejected me. And so the lightning and thunder came. And in verse 16 he says, Now stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. And verse 18 says, So Samuel called to the Lord, to Jehovah, and Jehovah sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel, because it was unusual. It was the measure of God's displeasure. It does us good, friends, to recall what God is and what he has done. Not only in his acts of mercy and kindness, but in his acts of judgment. Judgments that have come upon churches and upon nations who have rebelled against God. Oh, that we may never, never rebel against the Almighty. The final one is inspiration. It was to consider God's works 
and it is to Job. Job 37, verses 1 to 24, read it when you get home. It's a marvelous passage. It's from Elihu, the final of the speakers. And there are those who feel that Elihu was, was correct. And I, I heard my own paternal uncle preach on the prophecy of Elihu. I'm not sure it was a prophecy, but anyway, it was an interesting reflection. Uh, but it seems to me that after all of them have spoken, in chapter 38, God says to Job, and it's immediately after Elihu has spoken, he said, who is this that darkness counsel without knowledge? And I take it as a, a direct reference to Elihu, but to all of them. All of the miserable comforters of Job. And God actually said, he said, these men have not spoken the truth as, as Job. Even though Job seems at times to make some glaring mistakes, he was pressed beyond measure, and God doesn't hold it against him. And God says, you haven't spoken the truth as has my servant Job. But here, to Job and to all the others, he says, consider God's marvelous works. We had a good message about that some Sundays ago when uh, Brother Colin brought to us a consideration of the stars, the galaxies. I used to be able to quote the figures from memory, but I can't any longer. But oh, the wonder of the universe. Amazing. Amazing. And he flung it all into space in a moment of time. He spoke it, and it was created. He dotted the paths of infinitude with the milky ways of his universe. How long would it take to measure the universe? How long would it take to, to traverse the universe? It boggles the mind. Take the fastest plane that you could think of and go across the Milky Way. It would take you millions of years to cross it. Amazing. Amazing. And the summary of all this in this final chapter of Job is touching the Almighty. We cannot find him out. You can take that in either sense. You never find him out as being wrong, and you can never discover everything there is about him. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of mercy, justice. He will not afflict. That's not his nature. Men do therefore fear him. He does not respect any that are wise of heart. trouble with knowledge is that it puffs up, makes you proud, and as a result God can't deal with you, because he deals with the humble and the contrite. He says, the proud I know are far off. I can't get close to them. He does not respect those that are wise of heart. No matter how wise you think you are, it's minuscule in comparison with the wisdom of God Almighty. Give me a wise heart, yes, Lord, give me a wise heart. But help me to retain humility. For I recall that you gave Solomon a wise heart, and he made a mess of it. So what was it? He did not retain a humble disposition before the Lord. He does not respect the wise in heart. So, and it's a message that we take with us into our AGM, but also into the next year and years, should the Lord tarry, and give you all grace to face it. How long I will face it, I don't know. My life and your life and everybody else's life is in his hands. 
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. Doesn't matter what Islam does, it doesn't matter. We should protest, I am sure. But ultimately, the thing does not reside with Islam. The thing reside, resides with God. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. If we cannot claim that, and we do not know that of a certainty, then all is lost. The God of Jacob is our refuge.